Good morning, friends, and welcome to this service of worship on this Lord's Day at St. Paul United Methodist Church. Thank you for choosing to worship with us uh, here on our downtown campus. We are, uh, we are worshiping God together this day. Let us begin with a call to confession. Brothers and sisters, God not only desires our repentance, but longs to offer us forgiveness. Therefore, cast all your anxiety on God because God cares for you eternally. Loving, Loving God, God, we confess, we confess that, that we do, do not, not always bring honor and, and glory to your name. name. We, we are rebellious and weak. We, we flee before, before your goodness. Forgive, forgive restore, and, and strengthen us by, by the grace and mercy of Christ, Christ that, that we may rise up again in peace, in peace to for love and serve, serve your world. world. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, the Spirit of God is resting on you to restore, support, and strengthen you. Therefore, be at peace in the one who forgives and loves you. Rise up and give God thanks. Amen. Our first hymn is number 73, O Worship the King. I invite you to stand as you would like. Worship the King, all glorious above, all grateful he sing, God's power and God's love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with Sing of God's grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, whose chariots of wrath the deep thunder clouds form, and the dark is God's path on the wings of the storm. Affirmation of faith is number 881, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven, heaven and, and earth, earth, and in Jesus Christ, Christ his, his only Son, Son, our Lord, who was, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born, born of the Virgin, Virgin Mary, Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was, was crucified, crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father. Friends, as we worship together, a part of our time is always in, in bringing our hearts and minds and lives before God in prayer, uh, mindful that we, are, we together as a people are praying on behalf of God's children and God's world. And so we do that now. I, I pause just for a second to remind you that uh, as pastors and staff, we covet hearing about your prayer concerns and joys during this unusual time that we are all still going through. Please, uh, please let us know about them, as you will, uh, through email or calls or whatever works for you. But all, we also have a vital prayer ministry, and please take advantage of that. You'll see the contact information there on the screen where you can be assured that you will have people uh, dedicated to praying for your prayer needs as you let, that, let them be known. Now let us pray together as God's people. Redeeming God, you, you call us to devote ourselves to prayer for the sake of Jesus Christ, and therefore we offer our prayers this day on behalf of your church and your world. We ask that you would fill us with your Spirit's power, that as Jesus prayed, that we may be one with him, and as he promised his disciples and all who follow him, that that could be possible. You are at work rescuing, you are rescuing God at work and parent of the orphan, orphans and protectors of widows. We, we give and lift up to you all who are lonely this day, all who may feel forsaken or not at home in their place in the world, all who may feel imprisoned that they may be led out as if into a new land in your mercy and grace. We also ask you would help us to order our lives in such a way that we may know uh, that we are glorifying you, but also that we may be supported uh, by your family, the church, through your spirit. So often you seek to answer our prayers for all that is good through, through others and through your body. And we pray for the health of this church and your church throughout the world to this end. On this uh, Memorial Day weekend, oh God, we lift up our thanks and our acknowledgement to all, all those men and women who have served uh, and given themselves for others as we, uh, as a nation, celebrate Memorial Day weekend. May, uh, may, may they be blessed and may they know the eternal peace of your presence as we lift up our thanks for all the ways others, others provide for us. We pray, O oh God, that we may know an abundance in our lives uh, in a way that, that prompts us to reach out to others and gives us hope in, in the doing. As we hear and know about the struggles of people who are, who are sick, uh, who, some who may be still waiting for access to care and treatment during this time, and we know about others who are loved ones of sick and the sick and dying, we pray your special prayers for them. We remember uh, health workers and all who work for caring for others, whether with COVID-19 or otherwise, and all who diligently uh, provide service. We pray that those who grieve and those who struggle in these and whatever conditions may know your help, the Spirit's power. And may we again take heart as we remember, especially this day, that uh, Jesus, our Lord, prays for us. And may we not only be uplifted in that truth, but find ourselves in the middle of it in such a way that everything is transformed in your grace. All these prayers we make in the name of Christ our Lord as we together also pray the words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. During this time, we give God thanks and we respond to God's great gifts to us with the worship of our tithes and offerings. Uh, a word of thanks to those of you who continue to be faithful in your gifts, and please know the difference that that makes for your church, not only for staff and operations, but consequently for how we are able to continue in our work together and and especially in sharing the good news of Jesus. So please, again, thank you, and, and please keep them coming as God blesses you and you are able. You'll see the giving information there on your screen. There's an easy way to give online, uh, uh, give.stpaulos.org, uh, and follow the prompts, or if you will mail it in, P.O. Box 909, Ocean Springs. We appreciate that so much. Let us pray together. Glorious God, everything... It, that is given to us reigns forth out of the abundance of your love, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Bless these gifts and our lives together that all we are and all that we offer give glory to you in the name of Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Praise God from Sings flow, praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him, above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The scripture lesson today, friends, is the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, 
Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They are yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given to me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf, I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine is yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name so that you, that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It was 1936. In Spain, a civil war had begun in earnest. And in one terrible center of that fighting, uh, near Toledo, uh, there were an army on one side of the city and another on the other. And in the middle of that horrific fire, uh, fighting, there was two times every day when the firing stopped for a blind beggar uh, to tap his way on the street between the firing lines. Now that's quite a picture, isn't it? Uh, intense fi fighting and then all of a sudden an abrupt halt. I can imagine uh, that that some of those men, at least, on both sides may have welcomed that, that break, that hiatus. And some of the fighters probably thought or wished that the blind walker had made his way even a little bit slower to give them a few more seconds of peace. But then the reprieve ended and the slaughter began again and the armies were engulfed in the war. If you didn't know better, you might feel like Jesus was experiencing a similar kind of ceasefire or hiatus. He's in the middle of a few hours of relief between his, those who are after him, literally, his antagonists, struggling uh, to arrest him and, and, and to achieve their final success, which is his death. And their success, in other words, as they see it, is apprehending him and dragging him to trial and having him die. But immediately before this, now when Jesus is praying this prayer, he's shared his last meal with his disciples, those closest to him, and he's washed their feet, and he's been teaching them uh, from his humble example. And then uh, through several chapters, he begins, he begins to instruct them and teach. And now we have this pause that continues before the arrest and the trial and the crucifixion. And Jesus offers his prayer. Sometimes when we pray, uh, we need an oasis, and that's what we're hungering for, just a break, right, from everything that threatens us, everything we feel like is about to, maybe about to take us down or that's working against us. And, and uh, we are quite familiar with this hunger, this need that we have, and hence with this form of prayer. It's a reprieve, a break, a break in the battle for us. Another way we often pray, uh, as basic as it can be, uh, all, and with which we are most familiar, is the help prayer. That's help with an exclamation mark, kind of like the Beatles song. Uh, also known by, as the SOS prayer, uh, the panic prayer, the, Lord, the save me Lord I'm drowning, don't you care that I'm perishing prayer. You know what I mean. Anne Lamott in her book, Help Thanks, wow, the three essential prayers, which is a great little book, by the way. She says that is our basic prayer. Help. It's the great first prayer. Help. Help us walk through this. Help us come through. She voices the need of many of us praying for help, and we say, help, this is really too much. 
help, I am going slowly crazy. Help, I, I can't do this. Or help, I'm, I'm, I can't stop doing this. Or help, I can't feel anything. She goes on, help, he's going to leave me. Help, I have no life. Help, I hate the life I've created. Help, I, I forgot to have a life. I forgot to pay attention as it scrolled by. Or even, help, I hate her so much. Help, one of my parents is dying. Unfortunately, we haven't even gotten to the big ticket items yet. Cancer, financial ruin, lost children. But in his prayer that we read today, here in John 17, Jesus prays for help for us. He, he knows that we, he's also praying for us because we are his disciples, his followers. Indeed, all of his children need all the help, all kinds of help in all kinds of ways. But something far more is going on with his prayer. Here toward the end of his long farewell, he lifts his eyes to heaven and prays that his father may be glorified uh, as well as praying for his disciples. You know, it makes sense that anyone who's been in a position of authority and trust, and that certainly would be Jesus, before leaving on a great journey would, would pray for those in their care. Moses did that. Uh, Moses, of course, who had led the Israelite people for years and years. At the end of when he was about to take his leave uh, and go on that great journey, there's a long farewell and he lifts his eyes to heaven. He asks a blessing of the Lord upon all of the Israelite children right at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, it's kind of the thing you would expect would happen or you would hope that would happen, right? Uh, some time back, there was a mother who was sent to prison by the courts. She had two young children, and, and one day she just went off and left them at home, entirely by themselves. She just went off abroad on a holiday with her new boyfriend. Uh, the father apparently was nowhere in, in the equation. It's hard to believe a mother could do such a thing. What did she expect to find when she got back home? Tragically, those things happen in our world. But suppose it had been different. Suppose she herself had loving parents who were only too glad to look after the children while she was away. That would be totally different. Uh, she can entrust the little ones to them. She could go away safe in the knowledge that they would care for them as she did. Uh, it's easy to imagine that such a mother would give her parents detailed instructions how to look after each one the particular needs of him or her, and not because she did not trust her parents to look after them, but because she did. Jesus prays on their behalf. Jesus prays on our behalf. He's going away, and he is entrusting them to the Father as he, he has known and loved, the one he has known and loved throughout his earthly life, the Father who he knows will care for them every every bit as much as he has done himself. Now he is aware that they are at risk. He is praying for them and his prayer points to the very heart of who he is and what he offers. I heard of an agnostic, which as you know, literally means I don't know. It's a person who uh, would not classify him or herself as a believer, but they say, I just don't know. The jury is out. But this, this man had... Uh, an interest in peace and justice in the world nevertheless. And one day he came to a church, Christian church, hoping they would have something to say about achieving that or working for peace and justice in the world. So he attended worship. And it was a congregation that was in the habit of praying a prayer, like some of our brothers and sisters do, where they, they say just in every sentence, you know. Lord, we just want to help. We just want to praise you. Lord, just help us. Uh, Lord, just give us. Lord, just protect us. Just be merciful to us. And it, it threw the man off because he wasn't used to that kind of language. He thought that instead of justice, they were all care, all they cared about was just us. Now, that's not typically the, what people mean when we hear them pray that way, uh, but it was a big deal. Because Jesus models in his prayer 
a certain kind of way. Our faith isn't just about us, not by any means. We can be the first to confess that our prayers are anything but perfect, the prayers we lift up. You can understand how an outsider, <laughs> almost anyone on outside, might misunderstand our prayers. And the truth be told, on the scale of what's necessary, we often, uh, even in our religious life, focus on what ranks second or third or 28th or 29th, rather than really what should matter first of all. You know, someone has said our life with God is something like a cross-country event with between four runners. That first runner, runner is excellent, and he just leads the pack, and he's soon out of sight, and before you know it, he's crossed the finish line. Maybe the last one is kind of slow and lags behind, but there's this middle two able runners, and pretty soon everybody is watching them because they're battling for first and second. They almost forget about who's, who's the best, who's, who's gone on before. That is to say, we can major in minors so easily and settle for what's pretty good instead of the best. But Jesus' prayer faces us, us with what is and who is the most important. He's already told them, and again, the words we hear him tell them, the disciples, are words as if addressed to us. He's already told them, do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. And what would free the human heart from, from being troubled? The world has a multitude of answers, but Jesus has only one. Believe in God. Believe in me. And why do we believe in him? Because of who he is and what he does for us. Jesus is praying for us. He's inviting us into his life, the community he shares with the Father. And his prayer is this kind of living embodiment of the intimate union he shares with the Father. He's not only praying for them and us, he's inviting us into that life, into what he calls that glory. The 17th century philosopher Blaise Pascal <clears throat> uh, amazes everyone who studies about him because he was a master of Latin and Greek. Uh, when he was 12, he devised all kinds of things. He invented the world's first calculating machine investigated the dynamics of liquids, experimented with a barometer, had a theory of probability on and on, but died at the age of 39. Historians approach him from different, different perspectives, but they all agree that he was a genius. Now, humans can use their intelligence to hold God at arm's length, just like we can try to use anything to do that. Pascal had believed in God, but he wandered away from his devotion until he drifted it really into despair. And then one night, he faced God uh, and, uh, by reading this prayer, this same prayer from John 17. He, and when he did, he seemed surrounded by God's fire of love. That's how he described it. He experienced the highest and grandest ecstasy in God's presence for some two hours. And his life was totally changed there within that presence and Jesus' prayer for him. He drew, redirected, after that, he drew, redirected his genius toward defending the Christian faith and commending to others Jesus as the very character of God on earth. Another preacher tells about when his youngest daughter was in college and he was surfing the channels on television one night and he came across her college basketball team on TV so he watched, you can imagine, as a parent, he watched as the camera panned all the fans there. And sure enough, as, as he, he peered into the stands there, he saw his daughter Lydia jumping and waving and cheering, cheering her team on. And he knew she always had her cell phone with her, so he phoned. And when she answered, he said, hey, hey, Lydia, I just saw you on TV at the basketball game. She said, no, you didn't. He said, yes, I did. I'm positive I saw you screaming like a friend. You know, you're in the stands of the gym. She said, no, I'm not. I, he was confused, and so he said, I'm sure that. She said, Dad, the game was last night. It's a rebroadcast. When you read Jesus' prayer, it's not history. It's not even uh, a believable rebroadcast. It's in real time, you see. Jesus prays for us right now. He prays 
now, now they know that everything you have given me is from you. And my friends, that is a game changer. You know what that means? It means that our experience with Jesus, like that of Blaise Pascal, can be that of God's fiery presence right now. And yes, because we are in the world, which means is a code word for meaning that we have our trials and tribulations, our life with him can feel sometimes like that daily pause in the Spanish Civil War in 1936, that necessary time and space needed for bare survival. But as he, as he prays to God, he's telling us and showing us, inviting us to know that there is so much more. It is so much more than a chance to gasp in the middle of a too fast and too confusing, too dangerous life. He's offering to us, making it possible for us to know the same love, the same community, the same embrace, the same fire that he shares with the Father. N.T. Wright says he remembers the first time as a young musician that he sat in the middle of a school orchestra and played his small part of music on his instrument that he had been rehearsing. And he remembered that the experience of that happening all around him, you know, being a part of the full orchestra, instead of music he's just hearing that's coming through a speaker, a radio or record player speaker. And when we make Jesus' prayer our own, we are being invited to come into the heart of that intimate relation between Jesus and the Father and have it, uh, have it speak to us as if it's happening all around us. It's what his prayer is about, even more, it's what it does. Jesus, again, was about to die, and yet he prays for those he loves. He prays for us. We've all known people who pray for us. We also know the difference it can make to know that they are praying for us. And sometimes we, we can just say, I put my hand on the Bible, I could feel that you were praying for me. Sometimes all those, those prayers are, that we make uh, certainly reach God. Uh, they don't always affect us who are being prayed for. It's as if we're kind of resisting the very good prayers that are being prayed for us. They bounce off of us, kind of like a, a hose, water hose splattering water against a brick wall. That also is a dynamic we would keep in mind as Jesus prays for us and invites us into his life. Uh, Reverend Dr. Bill Henson tells a story from early in his ministry. He was serving a church that was trying to build a family life center and had to start from scratch. And after much agonizing prayer, they decided to purchase some land and move ahead. Well, he was on the committee to help select and find the land. So they started riding around looking at nearby property. And after the search began, one of his most unassuming members quietly walked up to him and said, could you come to my house and visit with me one day? He said, sure thing, George, uh, I'd like to do that, but I'm busy you know, trying to get some land and I, I want you to pray about that for me, but I'm trying to find this property. He kept on looking and a few days later, George came up to him and said, you still haven't come to see me. Henson said, no, no, but I'm, I'm going out there. I'm, I'm just busy. Uh, I'm just so busy trying so hard, you know, to find that acreage. And finally, George uh, sent word to him by another person who said, tell the pastor I want to give him the land if he can stop looking enough to come get it. <laughs> uh, well, that preacher, Dr. Henson, said he was most embarrassed. He drove up to George's house that day. He was standing in the yard waiting to meet him. And Henson said, I don't think I needed to open the car door. I think I could have slid out the crack. I felt so small. Well, you ever have days like that? You find that you've been actively defending against the prayers for you, batting them away as if you're trying to bat, bat away a tennis ball or something. And sometimes it's a while before even Jesus' prayer, prayers truly get through to us. But here in this moment, he's saying, it doesn't have to be that way. Here in this moment, in whatever circumstances you suffer, and whatever dangers seem to ambush you from the outside or surprise you from the inside, and no matter what race you're in that seems to be, you seem to be losing, or what manner of civil war rages inside you, demanding, demanding to give your attention, 
and your energy and your loyalty uh, something less than eternal. Jesus prays for us. And maybe we never get all we want from God in this life or feel like we do. Jesus, however, makes sure that we get all that we need. Believe in God, believe also in me, and know that I am always praying for you. Mm. He protects us in God's name, in the name that Jesus prays in verse 11, the name that God has given him. Jesus bears God's name, God's personality, God's character, God's deepest nature are all found there. So here's the invitation. Receive the gift of knowing and trusting that Jesus prays for you. My friends, if you will simply sit with that truth and call it to mind three times a day, it will transform your life. Jesus prays for you, not just one time, but for all time, and not just pieced out frugally, but all around. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Our final hymn uh, is number 472, Near to the Heart of God. I invite you to stand as you would like. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest, near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed This week in the assurance that the one who gave himself for us holds us in his heart along the Father and the Holy Spirit always. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God be with you. Amen.